The text for our sermon, this observation of All Saints Day, is from the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verses 2 through 17. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Here ends our, our reading. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you asked the twelve if they wanted to leave you. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Lord, open our ears so that we would receive what you have to give us, your word, your spirit and the gift of life everlasting. Amen. Saints of God, holy and dearly loved, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you are part of a church body that uses a hymnal, uh, something like this one, or in Canada, maybe Lutheran service book or some other hymnal, you will find a series of commemorations for different saints. Now, in this one that I'm holding in my hand, you have saints from the New Testament era, but it's not an exhaustive list. They didn't include any of the saints of the Old Testament or any of the martyrs or any of the fathers of the church, like Augustine or Ambrose. You can consult other calendars, other church works, to know which days the church gives thanks to God for their sake. But today we're going to talk about All Saints Day, which is a chance to give thanks to God for two things. First, the gift of eternal life. And secondly, for ordinary saints. This year in our parish, one of our members... Charlotte, entered into the Lord's rest. She lived in a senior's home, was known by very few people, and yet her death is precious in the eyes of God. So often, it's hard to think about those that we know as being saints because we're too close to them. We have seen their shortcomings, their weaknesses, their errors, their sins. 
One of the goals of All Saints Day is to help us to see them, not from the point of view of this world, but from God's point of view. I've often heard people talk about this as an illustration. You take some kind of needlework, and if you look at the back, it's not clear what the image is. You can see knots, the direction of all the, of all the uh, um, um, threads are going all different directions. But when you look at the front, you can see the image. And all of the faults are hidden. And God wants us to learn to look at ourselves and to look at others from this perspective, through the lens of the cross of Christ. And so it is that we see ourselves and that we see others as saints. That is to say, people who have been set apart by God and for God. When I look at myself, I don't see a saint because I see the things that I have done. And I realize some of the things that I haven't done that I should have done. I think... I know you as a person well enough to say that, well, some of these same shortcomings, some of these same rebellions that are in me are in you. And yet, I wouldn't hesitate to call you a saint if you have faith in Jesus Christ. Why? Because we walk by faith and not by sight. In the Apostles' Creed, we say, I believe in the communion of saints. That's part of our confession of faith. And so your status as a saint doesn't come from you, but from Jesus. He is the just, who declares righteous, he who has faith in him. Jesus has justified you. He declares you innocent. He covers you with his righteousness, so that you might appear before God without fault, without spot or blemish or any such thing, but holy and blameless. The Bible speaks of righteousness like a garment that God provides. In the book of Isaiah, we read, I will rejoice in the Lord. All my being will ring up in joy because of the God of my salvation, because he has clothed me in garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. God gives this to you as a baptized child of God. That's the reason why when a baptized, when a child is baptized, he often wears a white garment. It's a confession that Jesus is taking on himself that sinful nature. And that all of the sins committed by the baptized person, and that will be committed by them, has been taken on Jesus. Paul writes in the book of Galatians, All of you who've been baptized into Christ, you have clothed yourselves in Christ. And again, Paul encourages in the letter to the Romans to wear the righteousness of Christ each and every day. To live as a new creature in Christ that one is. Clothe yourselves in the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not give service to your sinful nature to satisfy its desires. The end point, the accomplishment of having been clothed in Christ. It is what we see in the lesson that was read of, of Revelation chapter 7. The saints wearing white robes. Now one of the elders comes up to John and he says, These who are dressed in white robes, who are they? Where do they come from? And John answers, My Lord, you know. And the elder tells him, These are those who have come out of the great tribulation. That is to say, this life. And they have washed their robe. And they have made it clean. They have bleached it. They have made it white in the blood of the Lamb. 
The holiness that we see in brothers and sisters in Christ isn't only but a glimmer of the holiness of Christ that becomes, that will become visible through his people. A, a, a glory that we will be witnesses of when we enter into that eternal rest that he has prepared for those who love him. And that is the end of holiness, eternal life. Eternal life doesn't begin when you die physically. Often we talk about people as passing from life to death. But Jesus speaks differently. He says, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He does not pass into judgment, but he has passed from death to life. Did you hear that? He has passed from death to life. Jesus gives a new life, a life that has no end. That's why we say that the saints are alive. And we also have the promise of a joyous reunion with them. And so it is that Paul writes to the Thessalonians and encourages them, saying, We now declare to you, according to the word of the Lord, we who are alive, who are waiting for the return of the Lord, we will not go before those who have died. For truly, the Lord himself, at the signal, at the voice of an archangel, at the sound of the trumpet of God, will descend from heaven. He will come down from heaven. And those who are dead in Christ will be raised first. And then we, who are still alive, we will be gathered up with them and that we will join them in the clouds to greet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. God doesn't tell us everything there is to know about eternal life. But Paul writes in his first epistle to the Corinthians, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. And to the Philippians, Paul writes, As for us, our right is the city above from which we await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our bodies, our lowly bodies, to make them like his glorious body, by the power, by his power to submit all things to his authority. So there, death will be no more. And there will be no more grief or crying or pain because that which existed before will have disappeared. There we will reign with Christ. We will receive an inheritance that cannot be destroyed or spoil or perish. It is reserved. It is kept in the heavens for you who are being kept by the power of God through faith, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last times. A little bit later in the book of Revelation, in, John chapter, in, in chapter 14, John writes, I heard from heaven a voice saying, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, and this from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors, but their works follow them. I appreciated a sermon from Bill Swirla in which he talked about this. It's an All Saints Day sermon that you can find on YouTube. Again, we need to look at our situation, not from the point of view of this world, but as God sees it. From a human point of view, Jesus didn't seem blessed. He was rejected by men. He was despised. He was falsely accused. He was condemned to death because of 
despite his being innocent, and he was crucified. But God, seeing that most blessed of events, the crucifixion, saw the most blessed act of all history. There we see the love of God. And thinking of Jesus, we understand what true blessing is. It's not what this world perceives, but rather a true blessing is being right. It is being at peace with God. From our point of view, death is the enemy. The wages of sin is death. And don't be mistaken, death is the consequence of sin. That's how we understand the warning given to Adam in the book of Genesis. You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat of it, you surely will die. Now, it's not that Adam's heart stopped the very moment that he committed this sin. But in sinning, he was dead. Dead in sin. And there is nothing blessed about being dead. But what is unimaginable? It's that Jesus takes the wages of sin on himself. The living God died to conquer death. To bless his saints. Precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalm 116, 15. And so we can say, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Without Jesus, death is not a blessing. But Jesus has gone through the valley of the shadow of death. And he has come out the other side. He has Con- he has conquered death, and he brings his sheep, his saints, through death. That's why the saints can say in Psalm 23, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Jesus takes our enemy, and he transforms it into a source of blessing, because through death, we now enter into our blessed rest. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, and this from now on. And you already have the the assurance of this inheritance by the work of the Holy Spirit. Death has been conquered, and in the same way that the grave could not hold Jesus, death will not be able to bind you and keep its grasp on you. The saints wait for the day of resurrection. Those who have died rest from their labors, but their works follow them. And it's not that their works are forgotten, but they don't precede them. It is not that through your works that you get into this eternal rest, but in the same way that uh, uh, a train follows the bridal gown as the bride makes her way down the aisle, Our good works follow us. All that God has accomplished through his saints, all the fruit that they have borne, all the good that Jesus has accomplished through them, every little bit of bread given to someone who is hungry, every sip of water offered to a thirsty person, every act of mercy, of goodness, of kindness, every confession of your faith, telling others of the hope that is in Jesus Christ, Nothing is forgotten. Nothing is lost. And we give thanks to God for his saints and for the gift of eternal life. And for us who are alive, we wait the day where we will enter into the rest that the Lord has prepared for those who love him. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, Keep our hearts and our minds steadfast in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.